Isaiah wrote this portion of the book about 712 B.C. Cyrus, the king of the Medes, did not conquer Babylon until about 500 B.C. We're talking now 210 years before Cyrus conquered Babylon. In fact, at the time that Isaiah was writing this, Babylon had not yet conquered Jerusalem. Babylon was still not a world power. At the time that Isaiah is writing, Assyria is actually the world power. And Babylon has not yet come into existence as a real powerful state. But before Babylon ever becomes the world-dominating power, through the prophet Isaiah, he speaks of the fall of Babylon. Now, Babylon did conquer Jerusalem and Judah at around 600 B.C. The first invasion was around 606, when they took as hostages several of the princes back to Babylon. And then later again in 596 or so, the Babylonians returned for the utter destruction of Jerusalem. And Israel was in captivity for 70 years to Babylon. But the Lord is announcing now the fact that Cyrus was to be the instrument through which the children of Israel would be released from their captivity. And so this is some 210 years before the event took place that God is speaking about this particular event. Prophecy. 210 years before it happens, God speaks about it happening and gives interesting details about it. Now, if you go back in Isaiah a couple of chapters to chapter 41, verse 21, we find that God is challenging the so-called gods of the pagans or of the heathens. And he is saying to them, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what is going to happen. Let them show us the former things, what they are, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare to us things that are going to come. Show us things that are going to come after this, that we may know that you are God's. In other words, God is challenging them. If you are really God's, then you would have the power of speaking of things before they ever took place. Show us then. Prove that you are God's. Declare unto us something that is going to happen. Declare to us the future. What is going to take place in the future? And naturally, those prophets of the false gods were not able to do such things. And so here is the challenge. Then again in chapter 43, verse 9, he makes the challenge. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is the truth. And so, as God is speaking to the people, he again is challenging, show us something, tell us something that you might prove yourself. In chapter 44, verse 7, he declares, Who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come let them show unto them. 
In other words, God says, who can do this like I can? Who can tell you of things that are not yet happened? Who can prophesy and tell in advance as I do? And then, of course, we will find in chapter 46, he declares, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, who declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying that my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now, one of the most fascinating facets of the Bible is that prophecy or predictive element that we find in the Bible where God speaks of events before they ever take place. And as Jesus said to his disciples, now I am going to tell you these things before they come to pass, so that when they come to pass, you might believe. So part of the purpose of prophecy is that of Bible apologetics. It is to prove that God is indeed the author, that God dwells outside of the time continuum. He is the eternal God living outside of the time continuum, and because he is outside of the time continuum, he can speak of things that are yet future, that have not yet come to pass within this time continuum in which we dwell. And so he speaks of the end from the beginning. And the Bible is filled with prophecies. Some of them have already been fulfilled, such as this one concerning Cyrus, fulfilled very exactly. There were 300 prophecies plus concerning the first coming of Jesus Christ that were fulfilled. You start to get into the science of compound probabilities and seek to determine the chance factors of those 300 prophecies being fulfilled, and you'll find that it is more than astronomical. There's no way that by chance these things could happen. And so God proves his eternal nature, his deity, by prophesying or telling things that are going to happen before they ever take place. And it becomes one of the strongest proofs of the fact that the Bible is inspired of God. As Paul said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. As Peter said, holy men of old spake as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So God has spoken to man. The Bible is that book by which God has spoken to man. And to put the seal of proof upon it, God has filled the book with prophecies, has spoken of things before they came to pass, in order that when they did come to pass, people might know that indeed God was speaking through the prophet Isaiah and God was the author, not Isaiah. So in chapter 44, verse 28, Cyrus is introduced. That says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple thy, thy foundation shall be laid. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar sent his troops to Israel in 596 B.C., and they destroyed the city. At that time, they destroyed the temple, and they burnt the residue of the city with fire. Jerusalem was destroyed. The walls were torn down. The temple was torn down. The houses were burned, and the city was left in absolute ruin. And the city lay desolate for 70 years as the residue of the Jews were taken captive into Babylon or fled to Egypt or to Saudi Arabia, to Moab, and were dispersed throughout the world. Now, 
God had predicted through Jeremiah that they would be 70 years in captivity. When they came into the land that God had promised to them, God gave them the law through Moses, and in the law they were to allow the land to rest every seventh year. Six years they were to plant and till the ground and gather the crops. The seventh year they were just to let the land go, just let the land rest, sort of rejuvenate itself. They did not keep that commandment. They had been in the land for 490 years before they went into captivity. And so God said, all right, you haven't kept my law. You haven't given the land rest. It is supposed to rest every seventh year. You've been there for 490 years and haven't given it any rest, so I'm going to let it rest for 70 years. I'll kick you out of it, and for 70 years the land will rest, and then I will bring you back into the land. Now, God says concerning Cyrus that he is the shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. If you go back to the book of Ezra, which is a historic book, you read in chapter 1 of Ezra, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, here's the thing. If you're not familiar with the Bible, because you're going back in the Bible, it doesn't mean that you're going back in history. Actually, you're going ahead in history. Isaiah was a prophet who prophesied in 712 B.C. Now, this book of Ezra took place in 536 B.C. Now, the first year of Cyrus, which was 536 B.C., the king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, in which uh, he said there would be 70 years of captivity. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and put it in writing, which said, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And then he, the proclamation went on to declare whoever wanted to go back and work on this project were free to do so. They'd be paid wages by the king and so forth. And Cyrus made this decree, this proclamation, even as Isaiah said he would some 200 plus years before the proclamation was made. So, verse 1 of chapter 45 goes on concerning Cyrus. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue the nations before him. Now, notice he acknowledges that he has uh, received the kingdom the Lord has given me, acknowledge the Lord of heaven, has given me the kingdoms. And so the Lord had said to him, I will hold your hand, right hand, to subdue the nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two levy gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Now, Cyrus was a Mede. He became the king of Persia because the Medes and the Persians combined together. And Darius was the king of Persia, Cyrus was the Mede, and there was sort of a co-regency between the two of them. But Cyrus was in charge of the taking of the city of Babylon, which was a very formidable task. The walls of Babylon were some 180 feet high. They were 60 feet wide. You could drive six chariots side by side along the wall of Babylon. It encircled this great city, which was 15 miles by 15 miles by 15. It was sort of a cube of 15 miles. 
the river Euphrates ran through the center of the city, and along the banks of the river Euphrates were these great walls, and there were major thoroughfares that passed through the city, and when they came to the river Euphrates, there were ferries that would take them across to the gates on the other side. This wall had the gates at every major thoroughfare, gates of brass, but in the center of the city there was a bridge over the top of the river Euphrates that connected both sides of the city. And on the one side, this huge palace of Nebuchadnezzar. And the city in that day and age was considered impregnable. There was no type of weapon that could assault the walls as formidable as were the walls of Babylon with the many towers around it. And uh, th the people felt extremely secure within the city. So that when Babylon came under the siege of the Medo-Persian army under Cyrus, it was almost a joke to those that were living within the city. Who do they think they are to assault the walls? And so just to sort of rub it in, the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, ordered a great feast there in the palace, several weeks' duration. We'll party while they're out there digging their foxholes and all. And so here this big party was going on for a thousand of his lords and uh, just a drunken brawl. And so during the midst of this debauchery, the drunken brawl, Belshazzar ordered that they would bring the gold and silver vessels that his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had taken when he captured Jerusalem. He had taken them out of the temple. They were vessels that were used in the temple service unto God. And he ordered that they be brought in, that they might drink their wine out of these vessels that had been consecrated to the service of God, out of the treasuries of Babylon. And as they were drinking their wine and praising the gods of silver and gold, suddenly there came that handwriting on the wall, finger of God, as it wrote words that were undiscernible to them. And so when his wise men were unable to tell him what the words meant or said, Daniel was finally called in, an old man by now in his 90s, and uh, was asked to interpret the handwriting on the wall because he was able to interpret the dreams of Belshazzar's grandfather in years gone by. And so Daniel interpreted for him the writing on the wall, which basically said, you've had it. Your days are numbered. And uh, your kingdom, numbered, numbered, divided. And so your days have been numbered. You've been weighed in the balances. You're found wanting. And your kingdom is going to be divided to the Medes and the Persians. Now, we are told that when this handwriting came on the wall, that... Belshazzar was so scared, his knees began to hit one another when he saw this writing on the wall. He realized it was something ominous. And then when the interpretation came, Daniel said, tonight you're going to be killed and the city is going to fall. And that very night, Cyrus came into the city. Now he did not assault the walls. But what he did was built dikes upriver on the Euphrates, and he gave the signal to divert the river Euphrates around the city of Babylon into the dikes that they had made. And the troops came under the wall at the river Euphrates, and that night the gates of the main gates there at the bridge were left open and the troops were able to come in. Generally, there were these great brass gates that sealed off the city, but they had been left open and he was able to come in. Now again, look at what God said. 
I've held your right hand to subdue the nations before you. I will loose the loins of kings. And years later, oh, Belshazzar, his, the, his loins, the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one another. And I will open before you the two levy gates. The soldiers were so drunk they didn't close the gates that night. And the gates shall not be shut. And he was able to come in. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse -verse venture through the Bible in our next broadcast as Pastor Chuck continues to guide us through the fascinating book of Isaiah. And we do hope you'll make plans to join us. But right now I'd like to remind you that if you'd like to secure a copy of today's message, simply order Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, when visiting thewordfortoday.org. And while you're there, we encourage you to browse the many additional biblical resources by Pastor Chuck. You can also subscribe to the Word for Today podcast or sign up for our email subscription. Once again, all this can be found at thewordfortoday.org. If you wish to call, our toll-free number is 1-800-272-WORD. And our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Again, that's 1-800-272-9673. For those of you preferring to write, our mailing address is The Word for Today, P.O. Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628. And now, on behalf of The Word for Today, we'd like to thank all of you who share in supporting this ministry with your prayers and financial support. And be sure to join us again next time as Pastor Chuck continues his verse-by-verse -verse study through the Bible. That's right here on the next edition of The Word for Today. Now, once again, here's Pastor Chuck with today's closing comments. Spend some time sitting at the feet of Jesus this week. Be careful that you're not so engrossed and involved in works that you don't have time for love. It is love that he longs for and that loving fellowship with you. That's more important to him than the works. He wants to come into his garden to enjoy the fruit. And thus may you have that time of sweet communion with Jesus as you pour out your heart to him and as you receive his love for you. <laughs>